indivisible. But let us point out that it does not exclude priority of nature, or what is called anteriority in signo rationis, and that this is sufficient. The production or action whereby God produces is anterior by nature to the existence of the creature that is produced. The creature taken in itself, with its nature and its necessary properties, is anterior to the accidental affections and, and to its actions, and yet all these things are in being in the same moment. So there is good reason to think that Kant just accepts this argument that you find in Leibniz. Early, his early writings support the conclusion that he endorses Leibniz's response to Malebranche's argument here. He describes attractive and repulsive forces, for example, as essential to matter and thus must view them as operative upon its existence. He also upholds an early division of creation into aspects whose dependence on God is through the mediation of the order of nature and those aspects which are independent of that order whose dependence is independent of that order. The existence or alteration of anything in the first class he describes as sufficiently grounded in the forces of nature, meaning that these forces are its efficient cause. OK, so Kant, on to section three, two here. Um, Kant clearly thinks it's possible to resist Malebranche's inference that God, as sole giver of being is in creation and conservation, must therefore also be the sole source of the ways of being. His early works subscribe instead to a version of Leibniz's view that God causes the existence of substances, while these substances are real grounds of their states. Though Kant's early model of the relation of divine and secondary causation acknowledges its Leibnizian debt, it would be rash to identify their positions. For one thing, Kant consistently rejects the pre-established harmony in favor of a version of interactionism. What's far less clear and hasn't really been examined is whether he ever accepts Leibniz's position that states are accidents of substances in the ordinary course of nature depend immediately on God. As noted, this is a key point dividing proponents of general concurrence from mere conservationists. Leibniz rejects the view of Durandus that, quote, this is Leibniz, God creates substances and gives them the force they need, and thereafter he leaves them to themselves and does nothing but conserve them without aiding them in their actions. Leibniz insists instead that, quote, the perpetual immediate influence which the dependence of creatures demands attaches not only to the substance, but also to the action. In rejecting conservationism, Leibniz notes that the view apparently met with disapproval in the writings of Pelagius. He seems to sympathize with a traditional theological motivation for concurrence, according to which the absoluteness of divine sovereignty favors a theory viewing God as immediately involved in all aspects of the world. Suarez describes as his, quote, best argument for concurrence, the idea that, quote, this manner of acting in and with all agents pertains to the breath of the divine power. As Ferdoso explains, the central idea here is simply that theistic naturalists should be antecedently disposed to countenance in nature the maximal degree of divine activity compatible with the thesis that there is genuine secondary causation. And Leibniz's language in staking out a middle position between mere conservationism and Occasionalism suggests a similar motivation at times. OK, I'm not going to discuss um, where Kant stands on this debate in the early works, because I don't have time. I'm going to skip this section. You can see from the handout that I say that he's not a concurrentist, even though you might make an argument that he is if you interpreted Leibniz's theory of concurrence in the way that Bob Slay interprets it uh, as a division of action whereby God produced the perfections and creatures produced the limitations, because Kant uh, espouses the same theory when it comes to his early response to the author of sin. I argue, however, that Kant, other evidence tells against attributing Kant a concurrentist view in early work. So I'm on to the next section, which I'm also going to skip over, supernatural action in Kant's philosophy. Uh, the only point I want to make here, and this is in addition to the discussion yesterday, um, so Carl quoted the passage at volume 2, page 110, 111, uh, but he didn't, he could have read a little bit further into that passage. This is the passage on miracles. I, I want to say that Kant has a stronger um, positive reaction with respect to miracles in this period than I think was uh, held or defended yesterday. So this is the passage, the alterations which occur in the world are either necessary and necessary in virtue of the initial order of the universe and everything which takes place mechanically in the corporeal world is of this character. Uh, 
are alternatively the same alterations possessed notwithstanding an inadequately understood contingency, a case in point being the actions which issue from freedom and of which the nature is not properly understood. And then he adds, changes in the world of this latter kind, the ones issuing from freedom, insofar as they appear to have about them an indeterminacy in respect of determining grounds and necessary laws, harbor within themselves a possibility of deviating from the general tendency of natural things towards perfection. And the key sentence, and for this reason, it can be expected that supplementary supernatural interventions may be necessary, for it's possible that the course of nature looked at in this light may on occasion run contrary to the will of God. This comes up quite a bit in notes. The idea here is, you find this in Crucius too, you cannot see how God would be able to avoid miracles if he gives creatures libertarian free freedom because they could just use this freedom and mess with his providential plans and he would have to intervene and have miracles of restitution to get the providential order back on track. And that actually is a theme which you can find continues in Kant's philosophy even into the critical period. Okay, I'm going to move on to the main part of the discussion, which is uh, the critical philosophy. Where does Kant start, stand on divine and secondary causation? So readers of the first critique have often regarded the work as limiting all discussion of causality to the empirical realm, thus as rejecting metaphysical theorizing regarding God's relation to secondary causa causation. Historically, this reading has been heavily influenced by the work's doctrine that Theoretical knowledge of causal relations rests on categories of cause, effect, and community, which contain the ground of the possibility of all experience in general from the side of the understanding. Kant's restriction of theoretical causal knowledge to a transcendentally ideal domain of experience in which the categories play a constitutive role is not, as it turns out, a rejection of supersensible causation. The unschematized category of causation the category and abstraction from conditions of its empirical application is said to allow for this supersensible application required by Kant's theory of freedom, his doctrine of noumenal affection, and his moral theology. It has nevertheless remained the case that the critique of pure reason's epistemic strictures and its attack on traditional theistic proofs are commonly understood as simply dismissing debates on God's relation to secondary causes of, su of such importance to Descartes, Malebranche, Leibniz, and Berkeley. Perhaps the most efficient way to dispel this misunderstanding is by turning to the positive theory of divine and secondary causation proposed and defended in Kant's critical writings. The Critique of Pure Reason des describes as one of its central aims the destruction of the roots of materialism, fatalism, and atheism. A late summary of Kant's thought argues that the ultimate purpose to which the whole of metaphysics is directed lies in addressing the questions of the existence of God, the freedom of, of the will, and the immortality of the soul. Kant's moral arguments serve this purpose, and the practico-dogmatic metaphysics that they ground is held to vindicate, quote, reason's proper claim to knowledge, a Kentness, of the supersensible on combined practical and theoretical grounds. Writings and lectures from the critical period remain heavily engaged with the rationalist theology of the German schools. In particular, Kant continues to debate the metaphysics of divine and secondary causation under Baumgarten's headings of creation, conservation, concurrence, and omnipresence. The philosophical theology of the critical period is accurately sum summarized by Alan Wood as the product of a mind fundamentally unable to conceive of the human situation except theistically and unable to conceive of God in any terms except those of the scholastic rationalist tradition. So the central question I want to address here is how the critical philosophy can insist on a positive account of God's relation to secondary causes in light of critical epistemological strictures. It's helpful to examine Kant's reason on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. His continued re rejection of occasionalist models of divine and secondary causation in the critical period appeals in part to the very epistemological strictures sometimes assumed to exclude all transcendent theorizing. The critique of judgment describes occasionalism in the terms the pre-critical philosophy uses in rejecting explanatory appeals to miracles as, quote, imposing a reverential silence upon reason in its inquiries. Kant presents occasionalist explanations as ad hoc, a charge he also levels against Cartesian and Crucian theories of a priori knowledge resting on supposed divine illumination. <clears throat> 
One might respond here that it's one thing to reject a priori justifications resting on purported divine illumination. It's quite another to rule out a positive noumenal theory of causation. There is nevertheless a straightforward sense in which Kant's rejection of occasionalism and divine illumination expresses the one preference for broadly naturalist explanation, where this naturalism is explicitly held to exclude occasionalism as a theory of the relation of noumenal and empirical reality. Practical grounds also clearly play an important part in the opposition to occasionalism. Kant clearly accepts Leibniz's view that creaturely agency proposes the rejection of occasionalism and the reality of secondary causation. Kant's mature philosoph philosophical theology is a moral theology, and this already provides reasons to reduce live options for God's relation to secondary causes to versions of conservationism and concurrence. Kant's rejection of divine concurrence in favor of conservationism in critical writings provides further instructive illustration of his combining of epistemological, practical, and conceptual arguments to justify a positive metaphysics of supersensible causation, even against the backdrop of his critical strictures. I'm going to focus on what follows on his arguments against Leibniz and German followers on the issue of divine concurrence. So several objections to concurrence which are repeated often in texts from the critical period are summarized in a footnote to the late perpetual peace essay. This is the long passage on the handout. Kant writes, as for the concept current in the schools of a divine intervention or collaboration, concourses, towards an effect in the sensible world, this must be given up. For to want to pair what is disparate and to let what, it, what is itself the complete cause of alterations in the world supplement its own predetermining providence, which must therefore have been inadequate during the course of the world, is first self-contradictory. For example, to say that next to God, the physician cured the illness and was thus his assistant in it is in the first place self-contradictory. This footnote could have used a bit of an edit, I think. <laughs> For causa solitaria non juvat, a solitary cause does not assist. God is the author of the physician together with all his medicines, and so the effect must be ascribed entirely to him if one wants to ascend all the way to that highest original ground, theoretically incomprehensible to us. Or one can ascribe it entirely to the physician insofar as we follow up this event as belonging to the order of nature and as explicable in terms of the order of nature. Second, such a way of thinking, that is concurrentism, also does away with all determinate principles for appraising an effect. But from a morally practical point of view, which is thus directed entirely to the supersensible, as example in the belief that God, by means incomprehensible to us, will make up for the lack of our, of our own righteousness if only our disposition is genuine, so that we should never slacken in our striving towards the good, the concept of a divine concourses is quite appropriate and even necessary. But it's self-evident that no one must attempt to explain a good action as an event in the world through this concourses, which is a futile theoretical cognition of the supersensible and is thus absurd. So in speaking of concurrentism here as current in the schools, Kant does not refer to Aquinas or Suarez, but to proponents of the theory in the German rationalist tradition, including Leibniz, Wolf, Baumgarten, and Meyer. One of his objections above, that concurrence does away with all determinate principles for appraising an effect, reprises a familiar methodological rejection of supernatural explanation. Suarez and Leibniz describe divine concurrence as necessary for, every, for production of every effect in nature and can therefore respond that parity of reasoning should lead Kant to the rejection of creation and conservation. It's important to emphasize that Kant refuses to take this step. He continues to affirm creation and conservation as essential components of his practical dogmatic theism. Kant's continued commitment to the doctrine of creation in the critical period calls, of course, for an account of the creative act consistent with the critical metaphysics. His official doctrine is simply that creation is non-temporal and it's directed at underlying noumena rather than phenomena. He says, if existence in time is only a sensible way of representing things which belong to thinking beings in the world and not to them as things in themselves, then the creation of these beings is a creation of things in themselves, since the concept of a creation does not belong to the sensible way of representing existence, but can only be referred to noumena. Kant's mature discussions of creation and conservation barely differ from those of pre-critical writings. The concept of God is, of course, now described as merely thinkable from the perspective of theoretical reason alone, 
it is, quote, astrotorically declared to have a real object only because practical reason indispensably requires this existence for the possibility of the highest good, and theoretical reason is there, thereby justified to assume it. The most prominent metaphysical difference between pre-critical and critical doctrines of creation concerns the non-space.